All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for that uh, great introduction. I'm going to share my screen. And yes, so um, one of the things I'm going to talk about in my presentation is um, some of the more kind of how you actually do this, this hands-on design with using a thermal ground plane in the actual electronic system. So specifically, I'm going to look at a smartphone and a laptop type of configuration. Um, and the exact type of one that I want to look at is working with this foldable thermal ground plane. So YC Lee had shown in his presentation that we can take a thermal ground plane um, a lot of what we have developed over the last several years based on this printed circuit board type of architecture, they have a good degree of flexibility. Uh, we took that a step further and made it into actually foldability. So I've got my little sample here. We can uh, open, close, fold back and forth many times. Um, and so this is the sort of uh, foldable thermal ground plane that can actually be very good for something like a laptop, you know, across the hinge of it or a foldable smartphone. And of course, the same type of thermal design that you use with a foldable thermal ground plane can be applied to kind of more stiff standard vapor chambers. Um, so kind of the outline I want to share actually what this foldable thermal ground plane is and, and how it works. Um, and again, we give this effective thermal conductivity and tell you not to use it. Um, it's mostly there for demonstration and show that it can be reliable for thousands and thousands of fold cycles. Um, and then once I've kind of established, you know, what this foldable thermal ground plane is, how you might be able to use it, um, can look at some of the details of doing the design with that and then applying those details into the design of a foldable phone of a laptop. Um, so first, um, we talked about these vapor chambers and YC had shown all of these vapor chambers developed in uh, partnership with a manufacturing partner, um, commercialized today. All of them um, do have a degree of flexibility. So we've shown our little flexible design. You can give it a bend. But the question is, can you actually bend it open and closed multiple times? You know, we do have this, we say it's a flexible circuit board type of of processing associated with it, flexible circuit board material. Um, how flexible is it? And the answer is you can flex it a couple times, but more than that, you cannot. The major challenge is this development of wrinkles over time. Once you bend this material, there's laminates, you unbend it, some of those will stretch, some of those will contract, and these wrinkles will start to block your flow patterns, they'll start to have stress cons concentrations start to crack eventually. And what we see is that maybe three bend cycles is okay. And then on the fourth one, you can bend it down. And then once you bend it back, either the flow has become blocked and you develop um, very bad pressure drops, develop hotspot, or worse, the cladding can actually have stress concentrations and rips. So um, we worked closely with the University of Colorado on this project and tried to understand some of the mechanics of folding and wrinkling, and were then able to develop this foldable thermal ground plane, this type of foldable thermal ground plane, where you can bend it back and forth uh, over and over. So the foldable thermal ground plane, um, one of the things that we like about it is that you can put in a maximum power over 10 watts in a small heater area um, against gravity, as um, we were looking at in our Q&A session before, it's important to note what is the maximum power when gravity is working against you, um, not just if it's flat or if gravity is working for you. So over 10 watts against gravity, and then we look at the temperature distribution of this foldable thermal ground plane, temperature distribution of a piece of copper, and we say, well, the thermal ground plane is about 25 times more isothermal than the copper. So the thermal conductivity, effective thermal conductivity is in this case over 10,000 watts per meter Kelvin. Um, and that's great. That's a great number. We can say, you know, this is a really good performing uh, type of fluid system, but it, this number is not something that you would want to actually use in your models if you wanted to put a TGP into an actual model. Um, so I said this is a foldable TGP, and we've got our little foldable 
you know, live demo. Um, but I'm showing these pictures of actually a very flat thermal ground plane. What happens when we do try to fold it? We've got this little video again. We've made our little folder tester that can go back and forth, back and forth, you know, reasonably quick. And so we can run thousands of cycles on it. Um, in this particular case, this is with a three millimeter bending radius. And when we try to do the lifetime testing of it with a thermocouple over the heater, a thermocouple on the far side, fold it back and forth, folding it about 500 times, pause the folding to make a heating cycle, measure the delta T, um, we see that after 50,000 cycles, the temperature distribution looks great. After 100,000 cycles, temperature distribution still looks great. After 148,000 cycles, that's when we start to see this delta T is a little bit, it's, it's not as great. And then 148.5 thousand cycles, that is when our thermal ground plane, our foldable thermal ground plane has failed. So we see this giant cold spot indicating blocked flow channels, possibly leaks. Um, but that, that shows that the foldable lifetime is nearly 150,000 cycles. And in fact, we've improved these ones. We just don't have the images for it um, above 150,000. And in fact, uh, in the near future, we'll have 200,000 cycles with three millimeter bend radius or possibly even um, lower bend radius with very high cycle count. So all of these results, this 148,000 cycles, um, these are all tests that are done after we pause the cycling. Uh, and part of that is just the test setup. So one important question on this foldable thermal ground plane, you know, does it still work thermally as you're actively cycling it? Is it just as good like this as it is like this and as you're transitioning? So in fact, the answer is yes. Um, if we look at our foldable thermal ground plane, you can have it fully opened with the thermocouple on top, thermocouple on bottom, have it fully closed with the same thermocouple locations. You can open and close it. And of course, the temperature is going to be different because this is cooled by natural convection. And so if it's closed, it has a very small total surface area. So the convection is going to be not nearly as effective as when it's fully open. But in terms of the delta T from one thermocouple to the other, you see that there really is no change. Folded, unfolded, cycling, folding, and unfolding. Um, so we can say that this effective thermal conductivity of the foldable thermal ground plane is good folding, closed, open, uh, active transitions. And we say that, you know, in the one particular case, it's over 10,000. Um, but what you really want to know is what will it give you in terms of performance enhancement if, for example, you take a foldable smartphone and implement a foldable thermal ground plane, or for example, a laptop and implement perhaps even a very large foldable thermal ground plane. And I'm going to show in the next few slides how you can actually do that. Um, so the first is that we don't say, you know, we, you have a block of thermal ground plane that has a thermal conductivity of 10,000. That's fine for, you know, showing off how good a thermal ground plane is, but it's not great in an actual design simulation study. Um, instead, we can look at a laminate approach, break individual layers down, and then use actually models that are, are not terribly complicated, good enough that they can be accurate, but simple enough that they can be simulate or they can run through computational studies um, without huge computational over cost overhead. So specifically, we say um, we want to look at this thermal ground plane in a smartphone and we can build a smartphone model just using thermal conductive models. So we say, you know, we have a, a battery and we know the thermal conductivity in the X, Y direction in the through plane direction. We have a piece of glass, we have a display. Um, and then we want to put a thermal ground plane in here. How can we model that thermal ground plane? Because it isn't just one giant chunk of material like you might have with a piece of copper or graphite. Instead, it is a laminate. So YC had shown this image before. In the thermal ground plane, you have the wicking structure with water in it, with some sort of wick structure that can create capillary force that can facilitate flow. You also have this vapor cavity that YC had shown the physics of vapor transport based on saturated 
uh, vapor at different temperatures, creating pressure distribution, causing internal convection. But despite all of that complicated physics of phase change and in internal convection, what we saw is that there's still a temperature difference and a heat flux. And if you look at the ratio of temperature difference and heat flux, you can say this is an effective thermal conductivity. So what we can do for this um, simple design that is still accurate is look at the uh, wick and cladding structure and as one type of material with an effective thermal conductivity and look at the vapor core as a different material with a different effective thermal conductivity that is a function of temperature. So first about the vapor effective thermal conductivity. In fact, uh, YC has shown how we derive this effective thermal conductivity depends on the thermophysical properties. It depends on the Reynolds number. If this is laminar flow, this is just a, a single number, friction factor times Reynolds number divided by two, I think it's 12. Um, and it depends on the size. So you can, in fact, just take this. You can look up steam tables, find what the vapor density is, and then find this curve, uh, effective thermal conductivity as a function of temperature. In this case, this curve is for a 100 micron TGP vapor cavity. Um, but we found that um, it, it's even more simple than that because we can look at one reference case, the case where the TGP is 45 degrees and we find that the effective thermal conductivity is 6,500. And then if we look around that, we can fit a curve around that as the vapor thermal conductivity is 6,500 times the temperature um, divided by 45. So you know, divided by our reference case raised to the fourth power. So we've got this fourth power dependence on temperature, um, dependence on centigrade temperature specifically. And the reason it's that centigrade is because water is this particular case where at zero degrees it freezes and you know, you've got some fun um, thermodynamics going on there. So 6,500 times the centigrade temperature normalized against our test condition of 45 raised to the fourth power. That's specific for this 100 micron TGP. Well, what if you have a different TGP that has different vapor cavity? Um, would you need to do all of this all over again? No, in fact, it's just the square of that vapor cavity. So we say that our general model is 6,500 watts per meter Kelvin times the vapor cavity divided by the reference case 100 microns to the second power times the temperature divided by our reference case to the fourth power. So that is this little dashed line curve. And this is going to be very accurate in kind of this 30 to 60 range and above 60 degrees. This is less accurate, but still um, you know, pretty good. And these are such high numbers that as YC had shown before, if you look at very effective versus very, very effective, you're probably not gonna see much of a difference and that this is a, a conservative assumption. So of course, to be the most accurate, you would want to have the whole thermophysical properties. You can look up from steam tables. If you want to be good and accurate and um, more simplified model, you can just use this 6,500 times your scales, um, second power with thickness, fourth power with temperature. So that's how we can model this vapor effect. And of course we want to say, you know, this is a model. Um, is it any good? The way we tell that is by measuring it. So we have one of our thermal ground planes. We can look at it under two watts and see indeed the predicted temperature distribution matches the measured infrared temperature distribution. We look at seven watts. Again, we have good agreement. So once we have this vapor model established, we can look at the wick and the cladding model. The vapor core model was very nice because it's kind of more generalized. Um, all thermal ground planes, all the ones that we make will follow this sort of application. Um, most of the vapor chambers that you'll run into will probably also follow this sort of, of distribution for vapor effective thermal conductivity. On the other hand, the wick and the cladding how effective that is in terms of heat transfer, that's gonna depend uh, greatly on the design. And there's a lot of different designs out there in the world about what a wick and a cladding will look like. In fact, we have a lot of different designs. So I'm showing um, for illustration purposes, what if you have a single layer of mesh? I think YC had shown 
um, what these meshes look like under microscope, under SEM. Um, if you look at, for example, just a unit cell of some mesh, some water, the water creates this meniscus type of shape. You have a cladding, solid material in the base and put heat in, and then there's a heat transfer coefficient associated with evaporation. Then you can find out what the thermal conductivity in the Z direction is of heat going into the TGP. In this case, what we found is that this Z direction TGP or Z direction thermal conductivity for our foldable thermal ground plane, it's about 20, 20 watts per meter per Kelvin. Um, there's some thermal resistance with evaporation, some heat transfer through these wires is okay. The water's kind of an insulator. You have to look at the whole stack together and it ends up being around 20. Um, additionally, we can look at this kind of in the XY direction and that's more simple. You don't have to worry so much about phase change, but it turns out to also be about 20. Um, on the other hand, if we look at, for example, instead of heat going into the TGP, heat going out of the TGP, especially if we're talking about our thermal ground planes that are our foldable thermal ground planes that have some printed circuit board laminate that have some more polymer in these colder regions where we don't have a heater, then that can introduce even more thermal resistance. And in that case, it's about two. So this WIC thermal model um, is important. And it's important to understand that, that the wick would have, the wick plus cladding has to act together and it can be an anisotropic and also depend on whether it's evaporation or condensation. Um, and it's going to depend on different TGP designs. So the values I have are for our foldable thermal ground plane. But once that's all put together, then we can indeed build our finite element models. Now we know an effective thermal conductivity. We know the functionality with temperature. We can put this into really most FEA solvers and find the temperature distribution. So YC showed this slide. All of these TGPs have the same design, but once we introduce this effective thermal conductivity uh, functionality, you can see that Different TGPs will have different temperatures, will have different cooling, will have different amount of heat going through claddings, and that can create different um, effectivenesses. So at different surface temperature distributions, different temperatures between the heater and coolers, and that can tell you whether this is a good solution for your problem or whether it's overkill for your problem or whether you need an even better, for example, thermal ground plane or vapor chamber. Um, and so what I want to summarize again, uh, it's okay to model with thermal conductivity, but not thermal conductivity of the whole TGP. The best way is this laminate approach and a simple method is an effective thermal conductivity of the vapor that depends on the thickness of the vapor, depends on the temperature with these simple power scaling. And then the wick, we say it's about 20 um, or two in the Z direction in the evaporator. And that's specific to this folding TGP, but it's going to be kind of similar for most other WIC type of structures. It's, it's the, the right sort of range. So now we can actually look at that in a design study, for example, for a smartphone um, and for a laptop. So in this case, what we can do is look at a kind of test condition smartphone uh, um, and see that if you use something like a graphite heat spreader, you may have a hot spot. Whereas if you have a foldable TGP that can take heat from one side over the hinge of your foldable phone, then that can spread the temperature or spread the heat to have uniform temperature. And if you have uniform temperature, then there's a much more area of the phone that's active in rejecting heat by natural convection. Some foldable smartphones, the ones that I know of at least, um, all have to be cooled by natural convection. So when the phone is more uniformly hot and there's more area that's actively warm, then you've got more area that is cooling by natural convection. Um, on the same can actually be true of a laptop if you don't have, for example, fan cooling. Without any sort of heat spreading mechanism, you can have a large um, temperature region, kind of a hot spot developed where the heating elements are. On the other hand, if you have a foldable thermal ground plane, you're able to spread that heat much more uniformly, much more of the laptop is involved in natural convection. So I wanna share kind of how we actually 
you know, we, we make this claim that thermal ground planes can double or even triple the power of a system like a smartphone or laptop. This is how we actually model that. So um, we use, for example, uh, ComSol multiphysics using thermal conductive models, but of different laminates. So for example, for a foldable phone, we looked at the Galaxy Z Fold 2. Um, Samsung's previous generation foldable phone. This one's very nice because there's a lot of publicly available information of people who buy these phones and then tear them apart. And we can look inside and try to build our models accordingly. So for example, we know where the batteries are, how big they are, and the motherboards. We have to make some assumptions about the effective thermal conductivity of these area or of these um, components. Um, of course, I think in our audience, we will have people who know this much better than us for your own systems. You'll know exactly what these are. We had to make some educated guesses. Um, and then with those guesses, we could calibrate it based on a solution that just used graphite of this shape, which is the shape we saw in this teardown video. Um, and then based on this, we could say, put heat into the CPU and increase the power until you have a hot spot of 45 degrees. And what we saw is that that happens when the temperature, or the temperature reaches 45 degrees when the power running into the CPU is 4.7 watts. Um, and that, that's pretty solid. You know, a five watts is about what you would want for a steady state in a lot of smartphone applications. On the other hand, what you can see is that one side is warm, it's, you know, cooling down pretty effectively by natural convection. And then the other side is not as warm, not as effective. And so that's why we want to look at implementing a foldable thermal ground plane. So if we put a foldable thermal ground plane through this hinge region, it can move heat very effectively from one side to the other side. Um, and then the way we actually model this, we take our model that we would calibrated with the graphite and now put in this laminate, put in the wick, um, the wick cladding combined laminate structure and put in the vapor chamber, which in this case, we know the thickness. So we know that it's just a function of temperature for the effective thermal conductivity. And then we can find out what the temperature distribution is. We can take this model, increase the power until we reach that same maximum temperature. And in this case, the maximum temperature happens at 9.4 Watts. So that's kind of uh, a fun coincidence is that once we have this very large, very effective foldable thermal ground plane, you can increase the power by a factor of two. So 9.4 is just twice times this 4.7. Um, and it should make some intuitive sense now that you're making this area, you know, you have instead of just one side active in natural convection, you have both sides very active in natural convection. And so we say that with this foldable thermal ground plane, we have this model just um, conduction based for the actual foldable phone with graphite. We calibrate it based on, you know, kind of this teardown video based on, I think there was a thermal image, not necessarily in that teardown video, just in someone else's blog about electronics. Um, so we could build this calibrated model and then just drop in a foldable thermal ground plane into that model and see some pretty substantial improvement. So that's about this foldable phone. Um, then we also wanted to look at this laptop. YC has already shown that we can take a laptop and um, eliminate the fan by putting in a large TGP. Um, and we, we did that. We actually measured that the, the power that the CPU is running with this large TGP is no worse um, with the large TGP and no fan compared with fan condition. On the other hand, what if we, you know, because this is a model, we can um, then compute what would happen if we had an even larger TGP. So the test case that we had before was a TGP that covered a large area, but not all of the surface. If we can extend the surface of the TGP, then we can look at what happens, um, what sort of improvements we can get. And then we can also look at what happens if we have a very large foldable TGP. So it has a folding region across this hinge area. 
Um, and if that's the case, then we expect we'd be able to move heat not just from the heater kind of out over everywhere, but indeed over the screen as well. And if you think about a laptop, you know, it opens up, it has the screen pointing up um, that's not terribly involved in thermal transport. But it, if it were, it would be like you have a fin, like a, a fin on a heat sink could be very, very effective. Um, and so that's what we were looking at. And we built our model again with a um, different components of the laptop going into this. And then we have just a COMSOL model of thermal conductivity. But it's important when we look at our thermal ground plane, we say thermal conductivity has laminate approach, wick cladding is one material, and then vapor is a different material with the thermal conductivity that depends on size, depends on temperature. And so um, this model could look at that, could computate all of that, and then we say, what happens if you have heat transfer out of different surfaces so that you can have um, increased power at the CPU package? And of course, this is probably a, a simplified model. This is a model that's based on what we looked at, some assumptions that we have to make, um, and it could be much more accurate if we you know, knew exactly what was inside the laptop. Uh, um, so it's limited by kind of our, our understanding of the laptop itself. But in terms of how the TGP is performing, we, we know that that is um, very correct, very accurate based on our uh, calibration and our verification of these models before. Anyway, what we see is that if you have no TGP and no fan, you have this nine watt performance. That's actually uh, based on a, a similar laptop, what we measure, about nine watts. And that's that's not bad. Uh, CPU running nine watts, That's you can do quite a bit of, of computation with nine watts of power. On the other hand, if you have a very large TGP, you can go up to 16 watts. So this is based on reaching the temperature limitation of skim temperatures in a laptop case. Um, with only nine watts, because there's not so much heat spreading, you might reach that uh, skin temperature limit early. On the other hand, with very good heat spreading, you can reach it later. And that very good heat spreading we can model by computation, just using that simple um, temperature functionality. This is 16 watts. Uh, YC has shown, based on our measurements, uh, I think 13.4 watts. Um, the difference between this case and that case is the size of the TGP. So this would be a very large TGP that covers essentially the entire D cover, the entire um, motherboard, keyboard, battery side, everything except for the display. So that's pretty substantial improvement. On the other hand, right now the display is not terribly involved in any thermal transport. So we have good convection off the surface here and not a lot going on over here until we do in our model introduce this foldable thermal ground plane that crosses the boundary into the display side. But once we do that, then we've nearly doubled our area for active, effective cooling. And so we have nearly doubled our maximum power. So we say 9 watts, 16 watts with a rigid thermal ground plane, 29 watts with a foldable thermal ground plane. So these are the sort of simulations that you can run. I think a, a lot of system designers will do these sorts of simulations for the components inside the laptops, inside the phones, inside of everything. Um, and now with these models, you can also understand the performance to expect if you implement a thermal ground plane as well. Of course, there's lots of other applications um, that we want to kind of highlight briefly for foldable thermal ground planes. So systems that you would want to have heat moved from one side of a hinge to a different side of a hinge that can then open and close as many times as you need it to. Um, for example, wearables of which AR and VR are one subset, but anytime you would want something kind of conforming to, you know, surfaces of us as people that are not, you know, square, as well as a number of aerospace applications. Um, where you would want some sort of motion, but also thermal activity. So I think um, I'd like to move ahead into um, summarizing what I was saying here about the thermal ground planes. We talk about these foldable thermal ground planes 
Um, first off, they're ready and reliable. We can say that they're reliable over 100,000 cycles. Um, our newest ones are up to 200,000 cycles. In fact, with this three millimeter bending radius with thin form factor, the hinge region, this, this foldable region is a little bit thicker than the non hinge regions. Um, but all of these are ones that we can then look at and implement uh, computationally into different uh, designs into, for example, a smartphone. So if you want to implement this sort of design also, um, the importance for simulation would be laminate approach, where we look at the vapor layer as one specific layer that has an effect of thermal conductivity, depends on size, depends on temperature, and simple model based on the square of the size of the fourth power of temperature. That is going to be very accurate. It can be more accurate if you use, you know, the whole steam table and everything like that. Um, but we found this to be uh, accurate to within all of our measurement um, accuracies. Additionally, we can look at the wick and the cladding layers. So, for example, with our foldable thermal ground planes, we have this 20 watts per meter Kelvin in the Z direction, you know, into the TGP with the um, design of the wick that we have and similar values in the xy direction. In general, those would not necessarily be the same. You can have kind of this xy thermal conductivity, maybe 100 for a very um, a type of wick that's designed specifically for that, maybe even lower. I think um, we had in fact shown uh, polymer thermal ground planes, and so if you have heat transfer through polymer layers, that would be pretty low indeed. On the other hand, it is something that can be modeled for each different type of thermal ground plane for each different type of vapor chamber. And these um, laminate structures can be introduced into the, the whole system design in order to understand what your thermal resistance is, getting heat into a thermal ground plane, getting heat out of a thermal ground plane. And then this vapor layer will tell you what sort of thermal resistance to expect as heat moves around a thermal ground plane. Um, so that's what we really want to share as kind of, I think, one of the important takeaways here is that these are not just something that we say thermal ground planes are great. It has a thermal conductivity somewhere, maybe 6,000, maybe 10,000. Good luck. Um, no, we have some very specific models and very specific numbers that can be implemented, um, as I showed with the smartphones, with the laptop PCs. And specifically in these particular, the foldable phone, the laptop PC, these thermal ground planes can be used to increase natural convection. They spread the heat, more of the whole surface is warm, more of the whole surface is involved in rejecting heat by natural convection. So you can put more power in without um, overwhelming the skin temperature limitations.